You're not supposed to do two in one. Did you know no. that? You're supposed no. to go, you're supposed to go five, four, three. That's how it works on TV. You're not supposed to say two in one on TV more than I have, Noel. I have not been on TV. I just know this because I went to a TV station once and they told me that. And I was like, really? Oh, okay. So I'm the victim of your fourth grade field trip? <laughs> I think it was like sixth grade, but yes, basically. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Compliance Corner. I'm Orly Burlov and... And I'm Noelle Vestal. Yay. All right. It's been a couple of weeks since we've um, we've been able to come and give you a Compliance Corner. I've been very busy the past couple of weeks with our CMMC day. If you haven't, uh, if you weren't able to attend and you want to sign up to get a link to the recordings, go to the prevail.com website. Up at the top, there's a link for you to sign up for all the recordings. But now that the CMMC day is over, uh, it means that we have an opportunity to be here and talk about some important compliance topics. Yeah, Noelle is already working. I'm already ready to go. Let's do it. All right. So today's <laughs> session, I feel like we're on Sesame Street, which is really <laughs> life is about being on Sesame Street. Absolutely. It's brought to you by the letter A. A or the letter A if you're ta- if it's American Sign Language. There you go. There you, you tell go. Me how you learn sign language. I taught myself. <laughs> That's a way to learn. I taught myself and then I did it as my foreign language in college too, in undergrad. Very cool. It is very cool. Um, all right. So A, today's letter is A, but specifically, uh, where does that all fit into our normal banter? So one thing that we've started to hear a lot more about, um, if you've been paying attention, you probably heard this about, about this a lot earlier than we have, but is the shift from talking about the NIST 800, uh, the 110 NIST 800 171 controls to the framework of how you look at um, a meeting the controls in term as a conversation around meeting the 430 NIST 800 um, 171 objectives and controls. And uh, those are spelled out in NIST 800 171 A. So that's why yep. we're saying the letter A. Letter um, A. The letter A, right. So, you know, this is why I love the show because we get to take, kind of take things that seem little small issues and kind of uh, explore them and see why they're a, a bit more important than we might otherwise think, but have thought otherwise. Noel, why don't you kind of just uh, give us a little bit of insight here and talk and uh, explain why why we're even talking about this. Why is this an important shift that we need to know about? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, back, you know, three, three and a half years ago, whenever uh, CMMC started becoming the thing, obviously everybody still had, you know, 7012 or most people had 7012 in their contracts and they were supposed to be doing the standard 171, but nobody really paid any attention to that as we all know. So CMMC came out and said, okay, we're going to do 130, you know, of these controls. That was version one of CMMC. Now we're at version two, which is in line with NIST 800-171. And we didn't really have any sort of, what's a good way to put evidence, if you will, of what it was going to be like to go through an assessment. We had the DIBCAC doing C3PAO assessments, but that was a completely different thing. So most people in the DIB were like, well, that doesn't apply to me. Like, that's different, right? Right. But now we have voluntary assessments that are happening with individual organizations with C3PAOs and the DIBCAC working together. And we're getting more information. And what we're finding is that for the most part, actually exclusively from everybody that I've spoken to who has you know, been a part of these assessments, they want the assessor wants to see every individual objective and how that individual objective is met. And that rolls up to the control itself. So that's kind of why this is coming out more. It's always been a conversation. Ever since CMMC came out, there has been those conversations from multiple different people in the industry and multiple people who are, you know, into the whole compliance space have talked about this. But it's but it's sort of been pushed to the side because it's like, well, we don't really know that that's how we're going to do it yet. So people just sort of, you know, kind of pushed it away and, you know, ignored it as much as they could and went on with their lives. But now we're getting this feedback from these actual audits or assessments, and it's harder and harder to ignore the objective conversation. Yeah. So let's just give people a quick image uh, so they can understand perhaps and get a picture in their mind of what this all looks like. So let me just share this quick snippet we put together. All right. Dun, 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 dun. Come on, videos. All right. Um, so let me just make this a little bigger so everyone can see it. 
But what this is showing, right, this is taking, for example, access control, which is 3.1.1. It's looking in terms of its uh, those six objectives, right? And so what we're saying is that, you know, controls, meeting access control 3.1.1, an assessor is going to look at each of these uh, six objectives in order to determine whether you are meeting it uh, uh, fully or partially, um, or it's not applicable. And so that's kind of the way it looks. And for each of the controls, each control has um, as many as six, seven, eight um, oh, objectives. Even higher than that. Yeah. <laughs> there are some I, that have like 10 or 12, yeah. And there's right. also some that have as few as just one. So, you know, you, you get both ends of the spectrum, definitely. Right. Okay, so this is kind of, you know, the framework of what we're talking about today. Um, and so you can understand the kind of this is a shift, right? We used to just talk about, you know, limiting um, information as, as system access to authorized users, processes acting on behalf of authorized users or devices. That's the higher level. But now we look at, you know, 3.1.1a, um, are authorized users identified? B, processes acting on behalf of authorized users are identified? and so on. Yep. And so you can kind of see, you know, this is the next level of assessment that um, assessors are actually going to look at. So let me just stop sharing the screen. Um, all right. And uh, then we can, can continue uh, this conversation. So we've talked about how there's this shift um, to looking at the objectives. So what, is this, what does this actually mean in terms of an assessment? What does it mean for someone who's in the DIB? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what it means is that it, you're going to have to start looking at the objectives more than more than you did before, if you aren't already doing it. And from a, from an assessor perspective, so yes, can you you know go ahead and just focus on the control itself and get that control met? You could do that certainly. There's there's no reason that says you can't. However, for the assessor, they're going to want to see that breakdown of every individual thing that you did, just like you were showing on the screen. And those individual things are those objectives that roll up into that control. So the, the shift that we have here is, is very focused on documentation, honestly. That's the biggest shift, I feel like. Um, you wanna make sure that you can document each one of those objectives and what you did for that objective and you know what is the evidence, what is you know the testing, the documentation related to it. You may have a lot of this stuff already done. Like if you, if you went through the 110 controls, you probably have a lot of those objectives addressed anyway, but you wanna be sure that you're addressing them individually and documenting them individually for the assessor. And I, I wanted to also point out that in the CMMC assessor's guide, it states that in order to meet a control, the contractor successfully meets the practice. That means that you met, then that's what you're going for. We all want the met, not the not met. And for each practice marked met, the certified assessor includes statements that indicate the response conforms to all objectives and documents the appropriate evidence to support the response. So you have to make, you basically treat the objectives similarly to the control, but once you get everything with the objectives done, then that control should be met and you should be able to just, you know, take that information and sort of summarize it and put it at the control level. All right, so one sarcastic comment and then one real question. So it seems like we're adding a lot of more bureaucracy and documentation to this process. Whoever heard of governments that didn't um, <laughs> rely and make their table stakes on bureaucracy and documentation. Indeed. Sarcastic comment aside. But point two, what would that mean if you're meeting um, a control 3.1.1 and you hadn't really ever paid attention to these six objectives underneath? Would you really ever be meeting the control if you hadn't really taken a look at the objectives? So that's an excellent question. So it, it kind of depends. It depends on your assessment situation, really. And that's that's really why we're having this conversation. If you have met all of that control, like 3.101, you've done all those things, but you haven't actually documented it at the objective level, you could still conceivably pass an assessment, but it's going to be longer. It's going to be more difficult. And your assessor is going to be can get confused and say, well, because you have to think about how they are now looking at it they have to look at it from a NIST 800-171A perspective. This is not a CMMC perspective, remember, because CMMC is not the law yet. So they're looking at it from a 171A perspective. 
one, and that is likely going to transmit into the CMMC right. process as well. That's but right. just something to think about that right now, when these assessments are happening, they have to check off those boxes for the 171A, which are those objectives. So if you can make it easier for that assessor to get that information, you know, why not do that? That's something to really consider is that anything you can do to make it easier for your assessment team is going to make it easier and conceivably more less expensive and less time consuming for you yourself right. as, as the OSC. So it's kind of a shift um, uh, in terms of perspective also from the DIB contractor in terms of how they have to prepare for the assessment. I think that was uh, the next point and we've kind of already answered this, but not thinking of it, okay, am I just meeting this top line objective of limiting in the case of 3.1.1 limiting information access but am i doing it in each of these individual six ways that's how i really test whether i've met the objective exactly um, so it's a little bit of a mind shift of how we think about this it is yeah and so is it possible to say that the shift is advantageous is it in any way possible to say that this is a better way to think about compliance you know, I will, that is a great question. And I will say, I will absolutely be the first person to admit that when I, when I started going through this process myself way back, you know, when this was kind of in the beginning in version one and, you know, people were saying like, well, you have to look at all, you have to address every single objective in your SSP. And I was like, what? That is crazy. That is like 430 things I'd have to do. Like that's nuts. 110 is a lot. It was because it wasn't really explained to me, and I think other members of the DIB either, as something that can actually be kind of an advantage. Because really what those objectives are is a breakdown of exactly how to meet that control. That's what they are. They are there for you so that you can say, okay, I have done one, I have done two. It's no different than like a honey-do list, right? If you've got a honey-do list that says, okay, well, I've got to, you know, wash the car. Okay, great. Well, yeah, well, what does washing the car entail? I have to make sure that I get a bucket. I have to get the, the water. I have to, it's a process so that you understand that you're not forgetting anything to make sure that you check off that one thing on the list. And that's exactly what objectives are is like, oh, did you remember this? Did you remember that? Oh man, you know, I don't know if I did. It's just breaking it down in a way that's easier for people to digest. And yes, you do have to document it for that assessor to make it easier for them because they also need it easier to digest for them because they need to check all those boxes off. If they can check all those individual boxes off, then they have less scrutiny on their side as well. They're not going to have somebody who goes, well, you checked off this control, but I don't see anything about how they're actually like, where are the specifics? If you have that information already available to them, they're like, oh, here you go. We're good. And you're done. It makes it a way easier and a way less bumpy ride in your assessment if you do it this way. And again, I am the first person to say that I was like, this is dumb. I'm <laughs> so... I know that I am coming at this for, you know, as someone who 100% was not on board with this in the beginning. But again, as we've we've now gotten more information and kind of understand how assessments are going to work, you know, pretty much going forward, this is really just something that I think is actually helpful to people more than it is a hindrance. Because really, like that example that you put up there, you know, one of them is like, you know, identifying the correct people. Okay, well, yeah, obviously you're going to do that. I mean, it's... <laughs> That's how access control works. So a lot of those those things and those objectives aren't really that complicated. It's not like they're more complicated than the control. They're not. It's just the correct steps within the control of how to address it. So hopefully yeah. people have a different mindset about it. But I again, I know that I didn't when it first started. It's not more work. It's really not. I know. It, I mean, it's a little bit more work with the documenting on it, but it's really not that much more work. It honestly isn't. And if, especially if you're kind of starting this or maybe you're like, you know, at, towards the beginning or even in the middle, it's, it's pretty simple to go, okay, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and put these objectives in here. I just want to check that box. And, and that way your assessment, like I said, could be, end up being shorter and hopefully less expensive as well. Yeah. I, I'll uh, just give the last word here to you. But when we were discussing this whole process yesterday, you know, you said, think of it in terms of a hamburger. So um, I'll, I'll let you explain that metaphor. I mean, what, if there's ever an opportunity to have a food metaphor, I'm going to be the person to take it. So if you have a hamburger, you're just like, here's my hamburger, right? And I'm eating it. Well, <laughs> a hamburger has multiple different pieces to it, right? You know, to create that hamburger, we all understand in our heads. Well, obviously hamburger includes, you know, some lettuce and some tomato or, you know, whatever. But you need to make sure when you're making that hamburger to include the bottom bun, 
you know, the, the cheese, if there's cheese and, and the beef, if, if it's beef or veggie or whatever, and you know, whatever kind of toppings need to be there. And then the top bun, because if you don't have the top bun, it's not a hamburger anymore. Without the top bun, it's just an open face burger, which is a different thing. If you don't have cheese, it's not a cheeseburger, it's a hamburger. So like there's a lot of components within that that make it specifically what we associate with a cheeseburger or a hamburger or whatever. And it's the don't same with the pickles. Exactly. You know, if you if you decide that you don't, you know, if you want to add like a fried egg or whatever, you know, then it's a fried egg on a hamburger. There's a lot of different things that it could be. So you have to be really you have to think about it like that. You're making a hamburger with each of these controls. You want to make sure that you include every individual piece that makes it identifiable as a hamburger. So there you go. The last word, the last word in compliance is McDonald's. I'm glad you got there. <laughs> or Burger King or whatever, you know, yeah. Whatever, whatever floats your boat. Whatever works for you. All right. Noelle, I think we've gotten our point across. Uh, thank you to everyone to listening. And if you're still listening after 15 minutes or however long that we've been talking, please keep uh, put notes or comments um, down below. Let us know what you thought of this session. And if there are any other topics you would like us to, to discuss, always happy to take customer suggestions. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.